1998, a movie named en called Enemy of the State came out. Uh, in it, a lawyer from uh, Washington, D.C., played by Will Smith, comes into possession of uh, some evidence linking a senior official at the National Security Agency uh, to the murder of a congressman. Uh, this official obviously wants to get this evidence back from the lawyer. And so what happens next is a frantic pursuit over the course of two hours of the movie, several days in, in movie time. And during that, the NSA deploys a wild array of surveillance technologies to track Will Smith down. They hide miniature cameras in his smoke detector. They put trackers in his clothes and in his watch. They tap his phones. They access his bank records. But without a doubt, the most formidable technology that the NSA uses in its pursuit of Will Smith is its surveillance satellite. This satellite, which arguably created a sort of uh, key aesthetic for the movie, which was, uh, you know, inarguably its most sort of compelling feature, if you will, uh, was able in the movie to watch the entire eastern seaboard at once, it seemed. It could track Will Smith and his associates wherever they went. Now, the movie doesn't portray anything new in the sense of power trying to hold on to power and crush the weak. But what's new is that the surveillance technology accessible now, as the movie would have it, makes power all the more vicious and further rigs the contest between the weak and the strong. Now, on an evening in 1998, uh, this movie was playing in a movie theater in Northern California. Uh, a man who works at a government laboratory, uh, the Lawrence Livermore National Lab, attended with his wife on a date night. Uh, and whereas everybody else in the audience was no doubt mortified by what they were seeing on the screen, he saw this surveillance satellite and was thrilled. He thought, we must do that. And so as the credits rolled, he rushed home and left a call, uh, a message that is with his supervisor. And it was very short. He just said, I have a great idea. Call me. And this sparked a government effort to develop something that resembled the satellite in Enemy of the State. Uh, what this team did initially is they uh, got a small number of digital video cameras and they strapped them together. Now, they didn't have access to a satellite, so they put it on a helicopter. And they pointed it down at the Earth. And with this imaging power, they were able to capture a very, very large area. And in their early tests, they showed that they were able to do exactly what the NSA had done in Enemy of the State. Now, their idea was not to track, you know, illegally track uh, lawyers who had come into possession of evidence linking officials to murders of elected officials. It was actually to monitor uh, suspected nuclear sites in places like Syria. Um, but they didn't have so much success in selling that concept to the government agencies. Fast forward a little bit to 2003, and it begins to be clear that the major threat that the US now faces is the improvised explosive device. And as one general put it in a classified memo, if there is one thing that is going to completely derail US efforts in Iraq, it will be these IED attacks. And what he called for was a Manhattan Project-like effort to stem this violence. Shortly after that, the CIA got put onto the case. Um, and they enlisted the help of an organization that some of you may have heard of. It's called the Jason Defense Advisory Group. This is a very secretive group of uh, civilian scientists who convene uh, once a year to advise the government on a very complex national security issue. Um, the government and the CIA said, Jason's, we want you to look at IEDs. 
And in their first meeting, they looked at technologies, how to put armor plating on Humvees, for example, how to neutralize an improvised explosive device from a distance. Um, but they weren't convinced. In their second meeting, they decided they were going to look at technologies for what they call attacking the network. Because as we know, IEDs were planted by insurgent networks. These are groups of people who look no different to their surrounding civilian neighbors, who are, who are spread out, diffuse within a city. And you want to find them, because you don't just want to get the IED once it's in the ground. You want to find the person who put it there, and maybe the person that person works for, so as to stop the next attack from happening. Uh, the official from the CIA who was organizing these meetings actually went on a visit to Lawrence Livermore and had a briefing about this enemy of the state style surveillance technology that they were uh, working on. He was so impressed that he invited this engineer, John Marion, to attend his next meeting of the Jasons on the spot. And in the meeting, there was a few technologies discussed, and then one uh, of the civilian scientists, one of the Jasons, said, I just can't bear this. If only there was a way to watch the whole city at once. And then the engineer stood up and said, well, I have exactly that. And he described how if you watch an entire city, sure enough, a, an explosion would happen at some point in the frame. Once you have the explosion, you can zoom into the footage after the fact and see who planted that bomb and track them backwards in time to wherever they came from. You can always also track them forwards in time to where they went. Once you know where they came from and where they went, you have locations that are associated with this terrorist network. Now you can track the other vehicles that went to and came to this uh, location and then you can track the locations that those vehicles subsequently went to. Soon enough, you would have a full picture of your adversary's network. Obviously, to the CIA, this was catnip. And so, on the spot, they decided that they were going to put their full weight behind this technology. Uh, the man who organized that meeting is still referred to in these circles as the godfather, because he put the people together to make this technology become a reality that we now contend with in modern life. A couple of years later, it was deployed to Iraq. Not long after that, it was deployed to Afghanistan. And it was used in exactly the way that it had been described in that meeting. Vast tracts of the city were, were monitored. Insurgents were tracked from the sites of incidents back to their safe houses. And the information of those locations would be sent to troops on the ground so that they could then, in theory and in practice as well, round up these individuals. Uh, all of the information about these operations is actually classified. Nobody was willing to tell me how many insurgents were captured, how many people were rounded up, and crucially, how many US service members' lives were saved as a result of all of the IDs that were taken off the map. But we do have some hints as to the effectiveness of these systems. Uh, soon after the first system was deployed, the Pentagon began investing in a whole range of aircraft built around this same concept. One single aircraft that they developed called Blue Devil was deployed to Afghanistan. It was a fleet of just four aircraft. And in three years, it was credited with the killing or capture of 1,200 suspected insurgents. Four aircraft. That is a staggering number. And that is just one of the systems that was in use. But they wanted to go bigger, and they wanted to go better. And so a group of engineers uh, at a number of different laboratories and uh, defense contractors came up with the most formidable system of them all, Gorgon Stair. Uh, 